Now, Megan is, as you'll see, a younger colleague who's emerging and brilliant career, I think, runs somewhat against the grain of what I've just said. Uh, Megan joined SDSC with a particular responsibility for teaching at the Australian Defence College at Western Creek only a year ago. And prior to taking up this appointment, she was a lecturer in military history, strategic studies and intelligence studies, as well as the deputy director of the Centre for Intelligence and International Security in the International Politics Department at Aberystwyth, which fortunately I can say and not have to spell. <laughs> um, she has also been a teaching fellow at Dear Old Kings, London, uh, particularly uh, with reference to the Joint Services Command and Staff College program. Now, I think Megan's journey to this point in her career is one that speaks to some of the qualities. You hear I'm always giving advice. You've heard that from Joanne, that I think all early career researchers need to possess if they are to thrive, not just in this, but in any fields. And those qualities, apart from obvious academic brilliance, are patience, adaptability, courage to move continents, determination, and a willingness to take strategic risks. Now, Megan grew up in rural Canada, which means that she has another invaluable quality, which is an appreciation that the Canberra winter is not really cold at all. Um, she studied at Carleton University, I think in Ottawa, and then undertook her master's at the University of Calgary, another very cold place, on strategy and science fiction. She tells me she initially thought of a career in museums and worked for a time at the Canadian War Museum, but ultimately she moved to do her PhD under the supervision of a very renowned military historian, Professor Hugh Strawn. Somehow, she was persuaded not to work on her initial love, science fiction, but grand strategy and command really hard topics. She's recently published her first monograph with the very prestigious Cambridge Military History series. And here, I think you see manifest the capacity for strategic risk and patience, because I understand the approval and production process was an attenuated one. Her book, Coalition Strategy in the End of First World War, which you'll see at the back, uh, focuses on the efforts of Britain, France, Italy, and the United States to forge a tightly coordinated coalition in the final, what turned out to be the final year of the war, but which they thought was not going to be the final year of the war. They were planning for 1919. And so she looks particularly at the Allied Supreme War Council and its role in coordinating Allied strategy, a strategy for victory. Her book's been described by Jonathan Boff, Boff of the University of Birmingham as timely, balanced and illuminating, essential reading for students of the First World War, Grand Strategy and Conflict Resolution. As I've mentioned, she now teaches operations and the art of war at Western Creek, while continuing on two main research projects. The first on the, on the very important notion of victory. And I think one thing that I think is, is um, very admirable about Megan's research is that she positions her work in a transnational context. Um, this is absolutely essential in Europe. People don't understand in monolithic um, national histories. And so she'll be looking at, again, how the allies of the First World War, I believe, imagined victory and how they thought they would in achieve it. And her second project, and here comes patience again, is that she's reviving her earlier interest in the relationship between journalism, future war literature, strategic studies, and government defense policy in Britain from 1905 to 1909. So in many ways, I think Megan confirms that however it might have been so in the earlier stages of my career, no woman in today's military history needs to choose but can excel across a range of genres. Megan. Great. Thank you, Joan. I think you're the only person who has ever referred to me as patient, actually, <laughs> I have to say. It's not one of my qualities. Okay, so what is it like to be a woman in international security was the question that was put to me. And in answering it, I realized that I really wanted to say something that would be useful to those thinking about entering the field or those pondering their current existence in the field. So I should also highlight, um, I guess Joan has, that I am a historian of war, so I come at this a little bit differently um, and from that perspective as a historian. If I had to pinpoint one phrase I found to be useful during my academic career, it's don't give up. So while that may seem like a message that anyone can apply to life, I think when you are a woman in this field, this point actually has greater currency. 
This is because there are situations that you will experience that your male colleagues won't have to. So I would say don't give up when people treat you like an inanimate object that they can ignore. Keep asking questions and keep putting your ideas forward. Don't give up when someone tells you that you'll definitely get a job because you're a pretty one, young woman, thus denigrating years of hard work. Don't give up when many around you are complacent about sexism. Seek out those who have a vision for equality. That may mean that you have to create uh, broader networks and perhaps global networks. Don't give up if you can't break into the boys club. Again, look for opportunities to connect with people who actually want to connect with you. Don't give up when you're the only woman in the room and you start to wonder what that actually implies. Seek out supportive colleagues, and as much as possible, ignore those that would rather not have to address their own biases about who should and shouldn't be in the field. There will be days when you will want to give up, but don't. They will pass. So in summary, I thought my message for today should be, don't give up. <laughs>